So hi, I'm Nate Angel from Hypothesis, and I really, um, I'm really glad to have you all here from, from the Moodle Moot US 2020. We talk about this being an annotate ed session, um, and uh, the reason that we do that is Hypothesis really participates in a broad community of uh, other educators and, and folks who are focused on social annotation and its power. And these logos are probably far too small to see here, but you can see uh, the what kind of wide variety of institutions they're getting involved in this. And um, <clears throat> a lot of these are, are actually Moodle institutions as well as, as institutions that use other, other kinds of LMSs. Um, if you didn't already know this, Hypothesis itself as an organization um, has a lot in common with Moodle in the sense that our entire code base is open source. We are very focused on following open standards. We help develop the open standards for web annotation. Um, and we've had a kind of a long history of participating in the world as a kind of organization that has a lot more in common with Moodle than, than some of the other players in the, in the ed tech space. Um, we have a, a relatively small team. A bunch of them are actually here today. You'll see Jeremy is here, uh, Michael's here, Franny's here, and I'm here. Um, there's a bunch of other people um, back at home doing doing other kinds of work, but I just like you to be able to see the faces of the folks behind behind the scenes. And so, what we're going to just try to do today is um, I'm going to hand the mic off to Jeremy in just a second for this getting on the page same uh, getting on the same page section and he's really going to kind of make sure that we're all understand what we're talking about when it comes to social annotation um, and how that works in teaching and learning and then we'll move to notes from the field where we'll be hearing from annotated community members at Moodle schools like Joseph Kennedy from Concordia College in Minnesota and Ben Tupper and Rebecca Todd Peters from Elon University in North Carolina and then um, finally, my colleague, uh, Michael De Roberts will be talking about hypothesis directly in Moodle. So that's more like the kind of hands-on stuff. And then if you want to stick around, um, we're going to try to finish all that up in a half an hour. But if you want to stick around afterward, um, I'm actually will lead anybody who wants to through a kind of, you know, we'll annotate our, a document ourselves. So if you're interested in doing that. So um, Without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand the mic over to Jeremy if he's ready. Thanks, Nate, and excited to be here. I'm a huge fan of Moodle. Um, there's some functionality that we uh, find important to our, the functionality of our tool and collaborative annotation that, um, and as how, how it's been designed that is only available in Moodle because of the sort of philosophy with which it was designed, which I, believe, which I mentioned quite a bit when I talked to uh, Moodle schools and actually which, uh, Joseph Kennedy was one of the people that was instrumental in kind of uh, teaching me about the ways of Moodle um, and how hypothesis uh, can can work inside of it. Um, so go ahead to the next slide, Nate. Um, I'm an English professor by training, um, and I used to um, hand out this poem uh, at the beginning of every semester um, uh, to try to inspire my students to, to write in the margins of their books. We've all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen, if only to show we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages. We pressed a thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. Now, there's nothing particularly radical about this uh, idea of annotation. It's been around for centuries, as the next slide shows. Um, people have been writing in books since at least the invention of the book, if not before. Um, but as, as reading starts to move more and more online, um, we, we lose the ability to write in the margins of, of our readings. Um, and this is a, a critical practice that obviously scholars and students have known about for, for ages, um, but becomes even more important online because, uh, you know, research has shown that students are not as engaged when they read online, they're not, as ret they're not retaining as much. So part of what Hypothesis is doing is uh, bringing annotation into the 21st century, uh, allowing students and, and teachers and scholars and everyday citizens to annotate on top of uh, digital readings. And so the next slide shows our Oh, let's skip this one. I don't mind. Uh, the next slide shows our vision for um, for annotation at Hypothesis. That any website, article, ebook, document, or piece of multimedia can have multiple layers uh, of annotation. That traditional layer of private marginal notes um, outside of Moodle. We disable this particular layer inside of Moodle for uh, privacy readings, but reasons. But people are annotating with Hypothesis across the web as part of everyday engagement with uh, you know uh, the internet. Uh, as well as part of professional practices. The Washington Post, for example, uses Hypothesis to annotate primary source documents from the news. Um, but most important for the purposes of those in, in, in education are 
private reading and annotating groups um, that you can create with Hypothesis and in, in the context of the LMS, like in Moodle, um, those private uh, reading groups are sort of automatically generated for you uh, via LTI. So when Hypothesis is active on top of a uh, text, you can select text to annotate and, and you can reply to existing annotations. Um, so this is meant to be a discursive, you know, conversational practice and you're annotating together in, in private groups uh, as I mentioned. Three top level takeaways before I pass it on to uh, some practitioners. Uh, three top level takeaways that I've learned in eight years of working in collaborative annotation um, uh, that from, from students and teachers. Uh, the first is that, is that annotation makes reading active. Um, again, this is that nothing new aspect uh, of annotation. It's why people have annotated in books uh, for centuries. Um, but one interesting thing that this slide points out that I'll just uh, reference is the idea of the different ways that, that students especially can be active or engaged with readings. And in here, in this example, that screenshot here, you can see students annotating with memes on top of a poem. So multimedia, the ability, you know, basically as Nate has told me before, every annotation is a little website that the student can design from the ground up with text and images and video and hyperlinks. Um, so there's a lot of power in the digital space in terms of annotation, a lot of ways to be, different ways to be active. Um, the next takeaway is that uh, annotation makes reading visible. And I think this is especially new um, because I think in my career teaching, you know, uh, before I discovered something like collaborative annotation, reading was really an invisible process to me. You know, typically in an English class, and I think in a lot of courses uh, in higher ed, you're, you're grading the final product of a lot of work that a student does. Uh, the essay, for example, in an English class. The, their writing is very visible. Their writing is the product on which you're sort of evaluating a, a bunch of other work that includes reading and annotating and how you, um, you know, how you process that and how you harvest that for, um, for, for critical writing. So I think it's a very powerful idea that annotation makes reading visible. For one, you can actually know that they did the reading, students that is, um, but you can also see how they're engaging with the text and, and guide them in their engagement um, towards certain learning outcomes. And then finally, uh, annotation makes reading social. And this is the one that students really latch on to, um, the fact that as this quote says, um, they don't feel alone anymore in the reading. Uh, I imagine anybody who's got a, a, a bachelor's or a master's degree or advanced degree, or really anybody who's, who's been in the classroom probably reading a difficult text has felt lonely um, and maybe sometimes a bit of an imposter and not knowing if you should be there. Um, and I think that making it social, realizing that others struggle with meaning um, and that working together is a powerful way to create meaning um, is, a, is a really powerful aspect of, of collaborative annotation. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Jeremy. I hope that gave everybody a kind of, at least an introduction to how to how we think about annotation. And that now I wanted to uh, actually introduce um, Joseph Kennedy, uh, who was um, really kind enough to join us here on this uh, on this little workshop in order to talk about um, how uh, hypothesis and social annotation are are, are happening at his school. And so, Joseph, I wonder if you would start out by kind of just explaining your role, let us know kind of what, what you do day to day. Um, you said you're pretty busy up there right now, so you don't, you don't need to dwell on it if you don't want to. And then give us an idea of, um, you know, how Hypothesis sort of got introduced at Concordia. My name is Joe Kennedy. I'm currently the instructional designer for Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, on the border with North Dakota. Concordia is an approximately 2,000 FTE residential private liberal arts college arm of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. For all the context uh, that I can give there, I myself am a national board certified math teacher at the 7 through 12 level. I'm also a speech coach, and the combination of the two means I believe very firmly in making arguments in a whole variety of ways from a very Aristotelian um, sense of, of bifurcated logic all the way to um, rap battles and interpretation of poetry. But I do believe that no matter how you're reading literature and how you're using evidence, you need a way to be able to evaluate it. 
uh, when, when it comes to writing or creating work, uh, every other step of the way seem to already have a tool associated with it. We have all sorts of tools where students can brainstorm together. We have all sorts of ways for students to share their uh, sources with each other. Well, we have ways for students to draft things together, to write things together, to edit and critique each other's work. But there really wasn't a good tool out there to actually assess source quality. So that's what intrigued me about Hypothesis. One of the professors at the college brought Hypothesis to my attention a couple of years ago. As the only instructional designer, I have, um, I have the ability to, to force some issues with the college and say, we should spend money on a piece of technology or another one. And so we took this on to do an evaluation. And uh, by the way, it just occurred to me that when you talk about uh, it makes reading social, hypothesis is like the Netflix party for reading. Uh, our faculty here have been using it in several different ways. Uh, the most prevalent use on our college is very much what, what my first thought was, and that is, how do we evaluate the credibility, the reliability, the diversity, uh, the trustworthiness of primary sources and opinion pieces? But one of our professors has been using it to help students evaluate local history, making it a lot more relevant. Uh, we have a couple professors who have the students, as they're teaching them how to be wiki editors, they use hypothesis for sort of the rough draft. So instead of having the students go in and edit wiki entries directly, they have them use the hypothesis overlay so they can talk about what makes a good edit to a wiki. They use hypothesis both uh, what I would call pre and post. So uh, faculty members will use hypothesis where they just throw a source out there and they're like, go comment. And then they let students just make all sorts of comments with very little direction. And then they coalesce that into uh, what did you find useful about your classmates comments? They use that to help the students draft a list of good ways to annotate. And then they also use it the other way where they take a list of what makes good annotation and they ask the students to apply that list. Uh, we have a, a professor who wanted to use hypothesis for more of literary criticism, poetry deconstruction in particular. Uh, hasn't been able to make that happen yet. The, the faculty just have a lot going on with uh, the hybrid teaching model that has become the norm. So that's a real quick overview. I can share some things students have said. I can answer questions directly if you have need of either of those. And I'd like to invite any of our guests here, you know, the other attendees to chime in. Um, you can either unmute or, or ask in chat and love to have you get involved in the conversation. You know, you, you really did list a lot of really interesting use cases, Joseph. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and um, I was particularly, um, I was kind of attracted to this one about using it as using annotation as a scaffolding for taking that further step of perhaps going on to edit wiki entries. Um, because it really seems like uh, a great way to kind of um, scaffold students moving toward um, kind of working discursively in public the way an edit on a wiki might do. And so it's sort of like a, a kind of set of training wheels in a sense, maybe to, to kind of take steps toward that more public intervention rather than, you know, the kind of disposable assignments that a lot of, a lot of classes would have us do. Um, is there a lot of that kind of, um, kind of open pedagogical work happening at your school? Uh, they, there is, um, it's one of the few institutions I've seen where the mission statement is still relevant today, hasn't changed in 40 years and focuses on students making a positive impact in the world. And so we 
there are you're required to do things like this in order to graduate. You have to have two major engagements with the world outside. And so there are lots of activities like this to show students where they can have an impact, uh, perhaps in a small but meaningful way, without having to spend three semesters creating a research project. Right. If, if you're passionate about the character Lightning Lad from DC Comics, The Legion of Superheroes, and you want to correct a wiki entry about him, but that is, that is, that is contributing positively. Maybe only 100,000 people in the whole world care, uh, but you're making something those 100,000 people care about a little more accurate or uh, adding a small insight that they might not have otherwise had. And I think Ryan had a question. Yeah, Ryan, did you actually, do you want to come on mic? And... Yeah, I was just going to ask um, that, or I guess comment that one of the goals that we have when I'm, or that I have, I should say, when talking with faculty and a lot of faculty that I work with is, you know, we want to destigmatize um, formative uh, work around interpreting texts. And it strikes me that this, um, that this could really be intentionally deployed, you know, to public, um, to have students do formative work in public. So, you know, it's okay if you're wrong. It's okay if you're, uh, you know, not exactly on to begin with, uh, because this is a, this is a collaborative thing. This is, we're having a discussion. This is a place where you're, you're in fact supposed to be wrong a few times to help build, um, to build a, a understanding. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where I was thinking uh, in terms of, um, in terms of the back and forth, but it, it strikes me that that's a cultural shift rather than a technological shift, right? In any case, hypothesis is a great tool for it, but we really need to um, aggressively pursue that goal with our students as, as a cultural outcome as well. So I kind of wanted to just chime in on that. Yeah, I think that makes real sense. I mean, the tool itself can't produce all the results we want, right? It has to be baked into pedagogy and, and the mission. Right. That's but the tool can the... point the teacher in the right direction though, right? That was actually one of the selling points for our faculty, Ryan, about the embedding the hypothesis tool in Moodle is it is relatively easy to convince a group of students in your class that the class is a safe space. And I say relatively easy because that's not always easy, but compared to convincing them the whole world will allow them to make mistakes, it is. And nobody outside of the people enrolled in the Moodle course can see that annotation. I'll stop sharing my screen and um, introduce our guests that we have with us today. Um, and uh, I really want to thank um, uh, Ben Tupper from Elon University for coming. Ben works as an instructional designer there at Elon and is obviously um, deeply embedded in their work with Moodle. And then Ben has also uh, graciously invited one of the faculty members, um, Dr. Rebecca Todd Peters from Elon as well. And so we have both a instructional designer and a faculty member here to talk about how they use social annotation um, and hypothesis at Elon University in North Carolina. So without further ado, um, Ben, I'd like to start with you and just um, ha have you introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit about how uh, Hypothesis got started at Elon. Sure. Yeah. So thanks, Nate. Again, my name is Ben Tupper. Um, I'm an instructional technologist here at Elon University. Um, relatively new to working with Elon. I just started at the beginning of this year, but before that, I was at the University of Michigan, um, also doing doing similar type of work. So I'm just going to share my screen here because it gives. I'm just got a little bit of a roadmap for kind of how we got started. Um, with using Hypothesis. So we started our pilot with Hypothesis um, in the summer of this year, um, where really we were, we were looking for 
um, a tool that we could provide to faculty and students that would kind of help with the social annotation. Um, this is something that we had we had wanted to do before at Elon and uh, yeah, thought Hypothesis would be a good tool to kind of fit that need. So we started this summer um, kind of slowly rolling it out. Um, we ran a few different professional development um, as we got ready to, to teach in this um, kind of uh, pandemic world that we find ourselves in. Um, and thought that again, Hypothesis would be a great addition to what we were already providing in Moodle. So, um, you know, we got hooked up with the Hypothesis crew and we went through the Hypothesis led training. Um, we did a webinar for faculty who were interested in it, um, started providing some sandbox courses within Moodle for faculty um, so they could kind of play around with Hypothesis in a low stakes environment um, and start testing out some of the different features and how it integrates into Moodle and how it could integrate into their workflow. Um, and right now we're at that stage where, again, we're putting together those focus groups. We're really starting to work with faculty and students to see how their experience has been with Hypothesis um, here at Elon. And so like just quickly, just to get into a little bit of the, the numbers here and what I love from a, from a Moodle admin side, I love the Hypothesis dashboard where we can go in and we can really dig into the numbers to see how how Hypothesis is being used by our faculty and our students. So since doing the full integration with Moodle um, and the beginning of the fall semester, we've had over 19,000 annotations used. Um, it's currently being used um, you know, in greater or lesser degree across 42 different courses with 32 different faculty members here. Um, you know, over 300 assignments have been created using Hypothesis and we have nearly a thousand students who have been engaged with Hypothesis. So, you know, I think that's a that's a pretty good start to our to our pilot here with Hypothesis. Um, and, you know, some of the faculty use and of course, Dr. Peters will be able to speak to this much better than I can. Um, but this was just a screenshot that another one of our kind of hypothesis power user faculty, um, as I'm calling some of the more heavy users of hypothesis, um, are using um, using this tool within their course. So things like small group work, you know, checking for understanding, using it as a formative assessment tool, um, a way to orient readers uh, to the readings. Um, you know, myself, I'm I'm currently working on my PhD as well, and I wish I would have had hypothesis when I started this because learning how to read academic articles um, was definitely a skill that took me took me a while um, and something I'm still working on. I, I feel like this is a great tool to do that. Um, and, you know, other faculty I've heard from have said this is kind of replacing that read this, post a thought, reply to others type of forum activity within Moodle. Um, so, yeah, so we're kind of just at the beginning um, of our hypothesis journey, um, integrating it into Moodle, um, but that's just a, a kind of quick overview of, of how it's integrating into Moodle for us and where we are in this process. Oh, that's great, Ben. I'm glad that you're finding value in that dashboard. That's a kind of new experiment we're um, working on to try to figure out how to surface some of the activity that happens. And obviously you guys have a lot of rich stuff going on. I'd like to, I'd like to bring um, Dr. Peters into the conversation, Dr. Todd Peters, sorry. Um, and uh, first of all, could you uh, help us understand what your discipline is, and then maybe talk a little bit about how you're using hypothesis and social annotation in courses. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm a social ethicist, and I am situated in a religious studies department. So I am using hypothesis in an environmental ethics class. Um, and I am teaching fully online, um, only about less than 10% of our faculty are teaching fully online this semester. And when I did some of the um, faculty development work this summer, it became really clear to me, I was not teaching in the spring. So I, this was my first experience teaching online this fall as I was setting up those classes and trying to figure out how I wanted to reach my learning objectives with my students. Um, you know, several things became clear. One was that we have 100 minute classes, 100 minutes of all of us online together was going to kill all of us. And so we had to think about ways of breaking that up and ways of making that um, offering opportunities for students to have small group interaction where they could really build relationships. Because again, the isolation of this pandemic is one of the things that our, all of us, but young people in particular are really struggling with. So I set up, so there are 32 students in this environmental ethics class. I set up um, permanent 
small groups of four people. Um, and I did a lot of research about sort of how, what sort of best practices in small group work and et cetera. And they said, you know, four people is optimal. Um, I did a lot of research on, you know, how to put those together to, to make sure that they were going to work. But those groups are my hypothesis groups. They use hypothesis daily um, in class. So, um, so there are two elements to it. Now, there's a lot of setup work on my part, um, which isn't, it doesn't actually take a long time once you know what you're doing. Loading it into Moodle, I have eight groups, so it's just messy. Um, for every class period, I can actually show you this if this would be helpful. Um, for every sure. class period, um, you can see, I'll go to my Moodle. As long as we don't feel like we're uh, showing off any uh, student privacy stuff. That... Oh, no, it's, I think it's fine. But you can see okay. here, this is my class, environmental ethics. There's uh, one of you know these little entries for every day um, of the class. And so I'll go down and you can see, so this was, yeah, this was Tuesday. Um, and they I tells them what the readings are, but then in order to access the readings, they have eight groups. So they can, the only one that's visible to them is their group. So they can go to their group um, and then do the annotations with um, their team. Um, and then I also, if y'all are doing Moodle, you should know these things that, that there's a Moodle book, which I learned about in the lovely training that I got. And on the last page of every Moodle book for each class period, it tells them what they're supposed to read and then what I give them some kind of guidance for their annotation. So this one was the one third, Tuesday for today's reading. So pay particular attention to the idea of modernity, what is modernity, et cetera. And then um, th this is what one group look like um, in terms of the annotations for this class period for today. And you can, um, you know, I can look at each of the individual students and see what they did. But, you know, e e each of the students, um, I mean, so I would, I would say that um, the good thing is they're doing that beforehand on their own. Um, whoever does it first is probably sort of having the most difficulty. Although I did tell them when they do their own annotations to turn everybody else's off so they aren't actually um, being guided by those their first time through and then to, um, to turn them back on and to read through. And sometimes I, I, in those assignments, I'll say, you know, think about these issues or annotate this or respond to one or two other students to get conversation going. So I just try to vary that so it's not the same thing they're doing every time. Um, but, you know, they already are going to have a reading every class period. Um, this is an easy way for me when I'm not in a classroom with them to be able to just do a quick look through to see if they're not if they're reading, but how they're reading and what they're understanding and what kind of things. I don't do it before class, so it doesn't help me know what I need to talk about in class that day, but I do review it after class and then I can follow up if I if I see their problems. But the, the whole like loading all those eight pages and getting all that set up, it takes 10 to 15 minutes per class period. So it's not, it's not a huge burden. Um, you have to, well, Michael will tell you all the things you have to do. You have to go through all these steps to get it all set up because you have to have a different document for each of those groups. Otherwise, they all populate. But when I was experimenting in the sandbox with it, one of the things that became really clear to me for what I wanted from it was that too many people were gonna create too much stuff in the document for students to do the kind of in-depth critical analysis that I wanted them to do with the reading. Um, and so four people in a group works really well. Um, it's not too big, you know, if somebody doesn't do it one day, there's always at least two or three people who've done their annotations. And then that sets them up for our in-class time in that 100 minutes, we spend at least 45 minutes of it in small groups where they are talking about the readings and they can use their annotations. They've already been um, really deeply engaged with the text. So it gives them a lot of fodder for those conversations. And it's been really helpful. Um, in, in, in helping to provide uh, something for them to work with and to talk through in that, in that small group work. So that's, oh. 
that's an overview and anything else particular i'm happy to respond yeah to. well um that's really really great i'm um, really very hands-on and um i'll just say in anticipation that you're kind of um, a pioneer Rebecca, in the sense that um, in this small group environment, you point out that it's a little bit messy to set up. One of the things that we're working on now at Hypothesis is to be able to tie directly into group structures in learning management systems like Moodle so that you don't have to go through that process of creating different documents and so forth for each group. Um, so there's a future that may make your life easier, we're hoping. I noticed that um, Hart in the chat here has asked if you had any um, issues with uh, with uh, grading their, in their group context? Yes, um, so that's a great question. So, so some of the limitations, one is the time loading it. Um, another is the grade book. Oh my God, the Moodle grade book is just a disaster because each one of these shows up and it shows up for all the groups. So I don't even know what the student's grade book looks like, but it's just a nightmare. I, somebody was asking me about that just earlier today. Um, so that, that needs to be fixed. Um, but the other thing that's really been um, uh, an issue is I can't give them feedback on how they're doing with their annotations unless it's okay that everybody sees that. So everybody in their group sees my feedback. And so I have had to be really careful about giving feedback that's sort of neutral to the whole group with the hopes that the students who it rel is relevant to will pick up on that. Um, it hasn't been a big enough issue that I felt like I needed to, you know, write personal notes to anybody, but it also means that when I'm grading them, I've had to keep a separate sort of record of like, if somebody doesn't get a 10, why didn't they get a 10? So I have to keep sort of a note on the side in case that student follows up and says, well, what do I need to do to improve my annotations? Then I can, then I can go back and look and see if that student has several things that have been sort of a theme or what kind of feedback. Nobody's done that yet, but um, it, I knew in the long run, it would be faster to do that than if a student contacted me to try to then go back through the student's annotations and remember what the issues were that the student was having. And one of the things that it, it did actually point out to me doing that was oftentimes groups of students are having the same problem with the same annotated assignment. Um, and so that's been, it's been useful, um, but having the capacity to give individual feedback that would be invisible to the other group members would be really helpful. Yeah, that's that's really good feedback, Rebecca. Thanks for that. Um, and uh, I, I, I just have actually a kind of a future, you know, looking forward thing because I, 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 I think that feedback is great. Um, right now, Rebecca's having to do kind of a workaround in order to make small groups work in hypothesis. Um, and that is actually something we're working on making inherent in the product. So instead of having to make eight different copies of a PDF and, and do some changes to the PDF to make sure that the annotations don't transfer one to another, we're actually going to be building small groups uh, features uh, in Moodle so that you can just assign something once. And then with whatever way we make it compatible with Moodle, uh, Moodle groups, students will only, you know, students will then go and be separated into different groups. And so that that, that is a goal that we're going to be um, uh, you know, working on and making happen. It's tough to estimate the amount of time, but it, it's going to get there. So, yeah. And one, one thing that we we realize, of course, um, there's a way that you can make a tool as we have that works in almost any LMS to a certain degree. But once you start wanting to tie tie in more intimately to the grade book and the file system and things like that, then each LMS has its own, uh, as Tolstoy would say, its own unhappinesses. Um, and so uh, we're, we're, we're working on them one at a time uh, as we try to do. And, and there, Moodle is such a popular LMS for us that, of course, it's, it rises to the top. Um, so, you know, I'm just conscious a little bit of the time. And I know some people may have to go, like Rebecca and Ben, you may need to go. Um, and so I wanted to make sure we got our conversation in with you. Um, if anybody needs to go, that's fine. Michael is still, if he has time, going <laughs> to um, do a demonstration, quick technical demonstration of how to get um, Hypothesis up and running in Moodle. But before we do that, was there anything else, um, Rebecca or Ben, that you wanted to share about what's happening in Elon? I just want to say it's a fantastic tool that it has really, really made a difference for me this semester in teaching. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you. 
Yeah, it so, really has. We've had really nice feedback from uh, from faculty and from students. So we're looking forward to um, keeping this as a, a part of our LMS moving forward. That's great to hear. Wow, good feedback from students. That doesn't happen every day, right? <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you both coming here. And of course, I invite you to stick around. Although, um, Ben, you probably already know this stuff because you've done it yourself. And Rebecca, you probably don't care because all you want it to do is to be up and running in Moodle so you can use it in teaching. Um, but that said, we do want to make sure that we capture it for anybody who's still here and for the recording. So uh, I really want to thank you both for coming um, and feel free to stick around or uh, take off if you need to go get, get back to work. Thanks um, a lot. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and so, um, Michael, I'm wondering if you might now have uh, enough time to kind of walk us through some of the, the technical yeah. details of getting Hypothesis up and running in Moodle. Absolutely. I'd be happy to do it. I want to do a, a, a walkthrough of installing uh, the Hypothesis LMS app in Moodle if you are a Moodle admin, making it available kind of uh, Moodle-wide in, in your instance. Uh, I want to do a quick kind of also demo if you're an instructor, how you can get it working there if your admin hasn't installed it in your school. And then I also want to do a quick walkthrough of how to then create a hypothesis-enabled reading in Moodle once it's installed in one of these ways. So those are the three things that I'm going to go through. Um, so the so for the first one, we're just going to talk about installing the LMS app for Moodle across an installation. And your first stop is this um, help article. Uh, it's got some links in it you need and also just walks through what I'm going to talk about uh, step by step. So um, do go ahead and uh, find this on the Hypothesis website. Um, and our first step here is to actually click on this link. It's going to bring you to this web form that you'll fill out. And once you fill this web form out, I'm going to make sure that, yes, I do have, uh, have the privileges to install external apps in my LMS. Um, when she, once you fill this out, you're going to get an automated email from us that contains a lot of details that you need to know um, about Hypothesis kind of and, and, and our piloting approach in general. But the most important part is that it's also going to send you a link to this page. Um, this page is where you're going to generate the, hypo the Hypothesis key and secret that you need to install us into Moodle. And as a Moodle user, you're just going to fill in your, your um, LMS domain. If your school has what's called a uh, vanity domain or vanity URL, just make sure that you type in the domain that appears um, after you log in. So I'm gonna go into our Moodle site, for example, for us, that would be this hypothesisuniversity.moodlecloud.com. That's, that's what I would put into the LMS domain, give us your email address, ignore the optional fields because they are for Canvas and click generate credentials. And when you do that, we're gonna generate you a hypothesis key and hypothesis secret hold on to those because you're going to need them for the next steps. Um, so once you've, once you've got past step one and you've uh, got your LMS dome, uh, sorry, you got your hypothesis key and secret, then we're going to move on to these other steps and I'm going to walk through it here in our instance. So after that point, as a Moodle, I'm logged in as a Moodle administrator right now. So I have the site administration button. I'm going to click on site administration. I'm going to go to the uh, plugins tab and I'm going to look for external tools and I'm going to click on manage tools. And then I'm going to configure a tool manual and you can see we already have a lot of installs here. You should only end up with one, but we're testing, but let's just walk through this. Configure a tool manually. Tool name, let's call it hypothesis. The tool URL, this is in our uh, help article, but I'll copy paste it here. Oops, sorry. LMS.hypothes.is slash LTI underscore launches. And then you see there's a place to add a, a consumer key and then a shared secret. And that's going to be what you generated in our generator. And then just a couple more settings and you're done. We're going to go to uh, privacy. And I'm going to make sure that share launcher's name with tool is set to always. We can leave the others as a uh, delegated teacher. The other thing you might want to consider is um, lots of times you, you can choose how, what you want your default launch container to be, but lots of instructors seem to prefer the new window. So you could set that up as a default. It just gives Hypothesis a little more screen real estate to work with when we open up in a new window instead of opening up um, in, the, in the embed in, in Moodle. Uh, that's it. You're going to, you're going to save changes. And you'll be done. Hypothesis will be available for your instructors as as a tool. Uh, I'm going to log in as a professor real quick. So now I'm in here as an instructor. 
Uh, and let's start by saying that someone has not installed Hypothesis for me. And so we're going to, we're going to do the same thing. Um, again, you are going to go to our help article. They're going to give you a link to a web form. You're going to fill it out. You're going to get an email back. And that email is going to drive you to this same page. And you're going to give us the um, LMS domain, just like I, I discussed. After I log in, I can see my LMS domain here. I want to be careful. I don't need to grab this little last bit of, of the address. All I need is this uh, hypothesisuniversity.moodlecloud.com. Obviously, it should match whatever your domain is. Don't just type in ours. In fact, if the domain is incorrect, your uh, credentials won't work. So do be careful with that part with any uh, typos. Um, after you've entered the domain and your email, click Generate Credentials. You will get a, a, a hypothesis key and secret back. Save that because you will need it. Uh, so now, Let's go into my class. This is going to look a little weird because we already have Hypothesis installed, but we're going to do it. We're going to do it anyway. We're going to turn editing on, and we're going to add a new activity or resource. We're going to select external tool. And now we're going, instead of choosing a tool from uh, pre-configured tools, again, we're uh, pretending we don't have Hypothesis installed yet. You're gonna press the plus button. And that lets us add a pre-configured tool. Now it's rather similar to what your admin would do. Uh, you're gonna give it a name, Hypothesis. The, the URL is in the help article. It is, found again. Um, lms.hypothes.is slash LTI underscore launches. Uh, again, you can choose your default uh, launch container, but I always recommend new window. Folks seem to like it. And then for privacy, share launcher's name with tool, set that to always. And in our directions, we do have force SSL turned on. I'm not actually 100% sure about that now that I'm looking at it in the moment, but I'm pretty sure, but I'm pretty sure you should turn it on. You can try it both ways, or you can write to support at hypothesis.is and say, your presentation was awful. I hated clicking that button. Uh, and once you've done all that, you're going to click save changes, and now you've added a new tool. And now you can go ahead and, and, and uh, use hypothesis in Moodle. So that is how you add us if you're an instructor and your school has not. For the last thing I want to show you all, I just want to show you whether or not you've added us yourself or if your school has added us, I want to show you how to create um, how to create a hypothesis enabled reading. So I already have editing on. If you're a Moodle user, I'm sure you know that if it's not on, you got to turn it on. We're going to add a new activity or resource. Um, I'm going to select external tool. I've started this one, but you can also find it in the all menu. Let's give our activity a name. You've either clicked on the plus button and added hypothesis as a tool, or you're going to select it from your uh, list of uh, pre-configured tools. You should really only have it in there once or need it in there once. We have multiple versions of it because we're, we're, we're also doing uh, testing. Um, you don't, at this point, you don't need to add anything to the tool URL, you did that when you were uh, creating um, uh, the tool. You might want to if you you might want to enable grading. And so right now I have this uh, pre-checked accept grades from tool. Your instance might have this not checked. If you don't want to be grading a hypothesis, you can leave this unchecked. If you want our grading bar to appear for you, so you can give students grades and push those grades back to your Moodle gradebook, then just make sure you check this off. Grade values must be points at this time. Uh, I think that's actually a limitation of the integration and not us, but uh, either way, uh, we can't allow anything but points at this time. And you might wanna make sure, um, no, everything else here looks good. Okay, and at this point, I'm gonna save and display. The very first time I open up a new reading, I get this page. And so it's asking me to either create an assignment out of the URL of a web page or a PDF. If you go this route, please note that it has to be a uh, publicly available web page or a PDF. If you have a PDF in Dropbox or something behind a username and password, say a library resources site, it's not gonna work through this. Uh, this needs to be something that, is, uh, a, so something that is publicly available. If you do have a PDF you wanna use that needs to be kept uh, private, 
you might consider putting it in a uh, Google Drive and then using our Google Drive integration. This will let you link up to a uh, to a Google Drive account, and and then and then from there you can select whatever PDF you want. I'm going to add a URL real quick, only because I don't know the particulars of uh, showing you our organization's Google Drive. Um, um, oh man, sorry. Uh, I want to I want to pick a news article, but they're all um, you can guess. Uh, here we go. How to eat on a healthy? How to eat healthy on a budget? All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna copy paste my URL in, and what you're going to see is my cat. But also, uh, you're gonna see that we've uh, pulled in the web page at this URL. We've added the hypothesis sidebar. At this point, you are ready to go. Uh, the instructor and students can highlight words. You get a choice to either annotate or highlight. Annotations can be made uh, private just to you, or they can be made uh, public to the whole group. I select annotate. I'm gonna write uh, my annotation. And in order for it to save the hypothesis, I need to click on the post button. And here's where I can post to the whole class, Port 101, or I can make this private and post it to only me. I can also highlight by choosing the highlighting function. And now that highlight will appear uh, for me. Highlights are always private. They're always set to only me. Uh, you can't make highlights uh, public. If you have more questions about creating an assignment or uh, getting us installed or how to use Hypothesis, you can reach out to support at hypothes.is and uh, we'll, we'll get you helped. All right. That was great, Michael. Hey, and thanks. And I know that um, you know people saw there that the only possibilities for assigning a reading were either a public web page or PDF or a file in, like a PDF in Google Drive. And some of those may not be options for folks. And I just wanted to let people know that one of the things that we're working on, as we mentioned earlier, is the ability to um, point to files that might be available in the Moodle file system. Uh, and then Michael also mentioned library resources. And so it's a slightly more complicated world, but what we're really doing there is um, developing partnerships with all the different uh, folks that provide digital reading environments that might be served through the library context or in a textbook distribution environment. Uh, so kind of like textbook publishers and the different e-readers and so forth. And so our goal there is to be able to make hypothesis available in those other reading environments as well um, on top of, um, you know, more complicated e-texts and so forth. And so there's a future where you can use hypothesis on a, great, a wider variety of different kinds of texts. Um, yeah, and Ben asked if, <laughs> if integrating with OneDrive is on the horizon. We, we definitely know that there are schools that use Microsoft storage as opposed to Google storage. Um, and so, you know, OneDrive is definitely something that we're thinking about. We haven't, we don't have concrete steps yet to address it, but it's definitely a consideration for us. Um, ben, would that be, would that be a game changer at Elon? Yeah, I don't know a game changer. I mean, obviously you saw from Dr. Peters that, that folks are finding ways around that. Um, we're in an interesting situation at Elon where we used to be a Google-based school and students right now are still using uh, G Suite email addresses. So <clears throat> that's the only, we're running into kind of a divide there where, where students can use their Google Drive and create things in Google Drive, but then faculty and staff have all been moved over to Outlook. Um, and so we're slowly in that process of bringing students over. So there's kind of a barrier that's been put up now that now faculty can request a uh, G Suite account, um, but it's just an extra step that they have to go through. Um, but I like that you address, Nate, uh, I was gonna ask actually, you know, using library resources <clears throat> or, you know, getting access to academic journals that are behind a proxy at a library, <clears throat> excuse me, would be incredibly helpful. Um, and that'd be a great feature to have. I'm, I'm glad to hear that y'all are working on that. Yeah, and it's um, in so like in the library context for journal articles and stuff, it might be something like uh, a journal provided by something like EBSCO or, or um, JSTOR or some other kind of like journal provider like that. Would that be true at Elon? 
Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I was thinking like JSTOR or Springer or something like that, where we can access it with our um, login credentials, um, you know, or by using a proxy if we're off campus. Um, right. But yeah, that'd be yeah. really helpful. And it's unfortunately, there's a lot of complexity there because basically we have to find a way to get the hypothesis sidebar embedded into the context of whatever e-reader JSTOR or Springer mm -hmm. or whoever it uses. And so it's not as easy as just putting it on top of a PDF or a web page like we see now. Um, and so that's why it's going to take, we basically have to, <laughs> to make an integration kind of partnership technically and, and at a business level with each one of those providers. And so we're talking to them all. We're actually um, in, the, in conversation now with a couple. Uh, so we'll, we'll be trying to knock them off one by one, especially with the, the big providers first. So, yeah. How about just another quick question on, on a similar topic using um, like textbook publishers and e textbooks and things like that? Yeah, it's really the same issue there. So okay. like each, you know, like Pearson or Cengage or, or right. whoever has their own sort of digital reading environment, right? And so what we're doing is we're talking with them about how to get the hypothesis sidebar embedded in there in a way that also recognizes the, you know, rostering and authentication that's coming through Moodle or the learning management system so that, you know, you can then also have like the private course group and all those things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's um, a more difficult technical problem to solve than one might <laughs> hope, um, or at least that we hoped, but uh, it's definitely something that we recognize because we really see that, you know, there's kind of, there's sort of three big areas of content that people might want to annotate. There's the open web, right? Like web pages out in the world. Mm -hmm. There's PDFs, and of course, those could be stored in different places, like we've already talked about. Uh, and then there's really e-text, and the e-text is obviously probably the lion's share of material that people would like to annotate. But each e-text is, again, not to dwell on Tolstoy too much, but <laughs> each e-text is served by its own um, difference, not necessarily unhappy reading environment. So that's what we need to integrate with. Awesome. Thank you for that update. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure. And um, you know, we uh, we. We have to do this kind of well. The once we're embedded in in a platform like JSTOR, let's say, or Cengage, um, that will probably be available. I'm crossing my fingers across all LMSs, um, so Moodle included. Um, so it's a little bit different than the like Moodle specific file storage and gradebook things that are really just a, a part of being more deeply embedded in Moodle itself. So we we could have a big win where we're like we're embedded now in JSTOR and it works for everybody. Yay! That's our hope. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah. The devil's always in the details on this technical thing. <laughs> are, are there any other questions that you had? I mean, you've got Michael here on the phone. So uh, <laughs> always a good time to, to run into. He's, he grimaces like, uh-oh, here it comes, the big question. Is yeah, there anything no, else that no, you had in mind? Not off the top of my head, no. You know, just starting to get these focus groups kind of rolling. And I'm sure we'll have more questions that, that come through from faculty who aren't you know, in the power user um, segment like Dr. Peters is, um, you know, they're our top um, top annotator right now at the university. Um, so um, yeah, and then it'll be nice, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll bring this into the spring and be able to do some more professional development with, with our faculty, um, you know, over the, over the break, over the holiday break and, and get it kind of rolling into, into more courses. So I'm sure, sure there'll be a number of questions that'll start coming <laughs> from me down the line, but. Okay, well, Michael has the um, benefit now of having a uh, co-conspirator to help him answer those questions. Um, you might uh, meet uh, Matt Drucker who just joined our team. Michael unmutes and then he mutes again because I already said what he was gonna say. Go ahead. I, I could also just add that now I'm just going to go on vacation and let Matt do the job for a while. So that's that's the goal. Matt will be doing all the work. That's great. So this is your last chance to see Michael before he disappears. Got one one quick question. When you when you point to a um, you are a publicly available URL like you went to an NPR site. So if you point it to something like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal that is behind kind of like a semi paywall, you know, where you can see like some of the article, but not other. And if, if we don't have an institutional, you know, agreement with them, like I'm, I, I know we have one with the times where students and faculty and staff can get a free New York times subscription, but something like the wall street journal, where we don't, where we might see a lot of our business or comm students or faculty wanting to point 
to those articles that you know might give you one or like three free reads um and i don't know i've never i've never tried that so i don't know how that behaves with hypothesis yeah it's a really good question and, and it's it's a little tricky i i'll start by saying i i know you were just saying like you're moving away from google uh, or have moved away from google but at least for right now my preferred method of helping folks to use pages like that is to just tell them like a pdf host it somewhere like drive and then serve it up through hypothesis because um well, there's some known issues and then there's some issues that websites, it, again, the short answer is kind of websites might block how we serve up, like how we choose to serve up uh, uh, pages and make them work unreliably or not at all. Most sites are fine, but when they're trying to lock down their content, uh, they don't want other people serving it up for them, you know, is, is one thing. So uh, when you are serving up a URL through Hypothesis, we are running that through what's called a proxy server, which you might know people watching this recording might not. So essentially it's just our, our server. In fact, I don't even know if I know what I'm talking about, but I, you know, I, I exude it's that confidence without knowing that got me this job. So, um, it, it, you, uh, it, essentially our server is standing in between you and the content you want. We're loading that content. Then we're inserting hypothesis into it and serving up the results to you. Um, some websites detect, and you can use proxy servers for lots of reasons. We, um, use it to display hypothesis. Other people might use it to let you say, get around a country's restrictions on what websites you can and can't view. Uh, other people use proxy servers to make you think you're going to your bank, but really they're in between and they wanna get into your bank as well. Um, so some websites just shut down proxy servers, uh, uh, set, shut down proxy servers trying to connect because they don't know why you're doing it. Other sites just uh, might limit the functionality. In the case of New York Times, it usually works but sometimes they will, they don't always necessarily see the end user, they see us as trying to connect to the article. So that three free quickly becomes overwhelmed because they just see hypothesis trying to connect to the same article over and over again. In addition, and because we're being a good guy with our proxy server, our proxy server does not allow cookies. And this is because we don't want you sending information through a cookie to that site and we're intercepting it on the way. So we're just shutting down cookies altogether. But that means that sites, lots of sites, even if they're not blocking proxies, if they want you to log in, use cookies to do so. And since we're shutting them down, you're gonna to start to have login problems. Um, so it's kind of the boring technical answer, but again, to go back to the short, Nate is nodding because it definitely was, but to, to go back to the short, short version, uh, we just wanna make sure that people publish sites and that's the best way to make sure they have a, a consistent experience. Thanks, Michael, that's really helpful. Yeah, no, it wasn't boring at all. It's actually sort of exciting. It kind of seemed like an international intrigue in politics, hacking, like all the, all the, it was like a James Bond movie of, a, of an answer. Thank you for that, Michael. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah, the open, I mean, this is one of the things that uh, is different about Hypothesis from some of the other social annotation platforms, right? Where they, um, they, the other annotation pro programs usually have you upload the content into their environment, right? Where they can have more control over it. Hypothesis has this other philosophy of sort of bringing hypothesis to the content. And when you're bringing it to the, the wild west of the open web, uh, there can be some complexity to it uh, as in the different reading environments that we mentioned as well. So um, yeah, that's why the answer is so complicated. <laughs> Sorry for that. Hopefully there's a workaround there, but um, yeah, uh, making a PDF of anything and then annotating that PDF is, is one one way around it. And just just one other piece of advice I know, I was giving advice at the top and said, you know, save the page and serve it up as a PDF. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Hypothesis, and again, this is more for the benefit of other folks than you, Ben, but you can embed videos and pictures into annotations. So sometimes folks want to serve up a web article that also has a video embedded in it. Students will watch the video while they read. You could be embedding that, the, you know, that video usually into an annotation as well. And there's the possibility in the future that you're going to be able to embed other types of media as well. And so as hypothesis grows in that functionality, um, you know, it should become more and more possible to go the PDF route. But for the most part, if you're getting a New York Times article, you just want the article itself and um, and, and printing it's the best way to go. Yeah, and there are actually, we already have a couple of other possibilities for embedding, right? We can embed videos in annotations and then also, uh, is it? Uh, uh, Flipgrid. Flipgrid. Uh, we're yeah, we talking, added that functionality. So Flipgrid can be embedded. Um, we talked about VoiceThread. People are interested in having VoiceThread embeds in annotations. Obviously you can also include equations and links. 
um, that, are, that are already there. You can write in any character sets uh, in an annotation. And then another one that's we've long been kind of trying to make happen is um, H5P, which if you're familiar with that, Ben, I bet you are. It's a uh, an open source tool that enables you to make like small interactive widgets that could be little things like formative assessments or other kinds of like educational um, kind of widgets. <laughs> um, and so um, people have done some experimental work already embedding H5P into annotations, which is amazing because then you can like, an instructor could highlight a piece of text and use that as, and then drop an H5P uh, interactive into the annotation related to that text. And it can become like a little exercise just around that little piece of text. And all they've had to do is, is really annotate it to get it there. Um, and so we're, we're a couple steps away from making that all work because H5P is a little more complicated than like a video. But um, our goal is to try to have things like that embeddable in the annotations as well. That'd be, that's very cool. Thank you. Yeah, if you know Steel Wagstaff, who used to be at um, University of Wisconsin Madison in a role similar to you, uh, and is now working for um, Pressbooks, the WordPress-based um, sort of textbook platform or book platform, um, Steel's done a lot of really great work on uh, integrating H5P and Hypothesis in mostly in a Canvas environment, but it, no reason why it couldn't work in, in a Moodle environment as well. That's great. I'm in, I'm in a similar boat. I'm gone from Canvas at U of M to Moodle down here. So learning learning a new language here in Moodle a little yeah. bit this year. Boy, you picked a fun time to move. So you're like, hey, I think I'm going to change jobs. And then pandemic hits. Boom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> move cross country <laughs> and a new job in a pandemic. Right. And then you're suddenly the person in charge of getting everyone online. Do you have how big of a team do you have there at Elon? Um, well, in our training and development team, let's see, there's one, two, three, four four of us in training and development, which is a part of our teaching and learning technologies, which includes a, a few different other nodes. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, we're, we've, we've got busy. A, had a lot of work this year. <laughs> yeah. Understatement, right? Well, everybody has. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your being here. And actually this post conversation too, I think generated a lot of really interesting information. Thank you for coming, Ben, and uh, being so engaged. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having myself and Dr. Peters here. It was really nice to to talk to y'all and meet and meet you.